just in time, and this is why a German has to open the session because we're keeping the times always. Just in time, I want to welcome you to a, another international debate regarding COVID-19, how to manage and handle the crisis. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, people around the world with me. And you see, this is these are the names of the panelists. Uh, these are my friends from mainland China, Professor Li, Professor Wang, Professor Lu, Professor Pan. And then the two Hong Kong guys who are waiting for more and more patients, Professor Lam and Professor Man. It's from the UK, Palaf Shah, handling a lot of patients in London, except the Prime Minister, what he told me. And then from India, Professor Maturo, and from Egypt, Professor. Um, the agenda for this afternoon or the, for this evening, um, we will give you an update about the situation in different countries, followed by a discussion about how to diagnose, what are the treatment options and, may, and what are the points that we can think about discharging patients from our hospital system and maybe also what we should recommend for the follow-up of those patients. Um, I want to thank at that point uh, Broncos, who gives us the opportunity to hold that meeting today, to offer us the platform, um, to providing you, uh, especially all those around the world who want to listen to the Chinese experts who went to Wuhan and have had a lot of experience and also went to the disease. So let me start with the German update, what is ongoing. And due to the reason that I'm the first speaker, I can show the world map. Uh, taken early, uh, four hours earlier, we have now one, nearly 1 1.5 million infected patients. We lost about 75,000 patients around the world, but we also are lucky that a couple of those patients are cured now. We can send them back home. Uh, the situation in Europe, it's a little bit dominated by the South countries, so Spain and Italy, followed by Germany. Um, we have uh, Germany just reached 100,000, so these are the data from, from this night. So actually, we have a, a little bit more than 100,000. So the numbers are still increasing here in Europe. Um, we have areas where we only have very limited infected patients, like in Russia. For me, this is more or less the question if the test capacity is there in Russia, because I believe at the end of the day, we will have everywhere in the world the same amount of patients compared to the population. This is especially the situation in Germany. Um, you see that uh, we have most of the patients in the south. These are the dark blue areas. Um, the explanation for, the, for that is for me that the south area is more connected to the southern part of Europe, to Italy and Spain. So, and especially we have had uh, four weeks ago uh, skiing vacation, so all the schools have been off for one week, and most of the South German went skiing to Switzerland, Italy, and to Austria, and I think therefore we have way more infected people brought in the country by the vacation period, which is only really in the South part so popular, in the North part people go more for other sports activity in the vacation, not for skiing. When you look to the age distribution, so most of the Germans are in age range between 35 and 60. I think this is quite in line with what we're knowing from, from the Chinese uh, patients. But when you look to the patient who died, then it's clearly that uh, based on the age and the sex, we knowing these are the risk factors to having a severe or maybe even a fetal outcome, 
So you clearly see that when you get older, then you have way a higher mortality rate than in the younger population. And it's always dominated by the males. Uh, females seems to be more protected. The reason why we have more females died in age above 90 is we do not have so many German males in an age about, above 90. This is dominated by the females. When you look to the death rates international, then Germany has a death rate by 3% compared to other areas. Uh, so Germany is at the moment really on the lucky side. Um, and uh, everybody asked me why the hell Germany is able to handle that. Palaf Shah from London always explains that uh, Germany has the best doctors. Um, I believe that Germany has good doctors, but the, the rest of the world as well. So this is my explanation why we maybe have a better outcome. These are the numbers of ICU beds per 100,000 uh, inhabitants, and Germany has a lot of ICU beds. So we have more ICU beds than other areas in Europe. And you see that compared to Italy and Spain, we have three times more of ICU beds. And this is for me one of the explanations we maybe are able to handle the patient a little bit better because the capacity of the hospital system is one of the best on the world. At the end, or the other side of the, of the coin, it's also one of the most expensive health systems worldwide. The other reason are the number of tests we performing. Um, in red is the German line. You see the number of test capacity we have per inhabitant. So we have quite good test capacity from the beginning for me. The numbers of mild disease patient is higher in Germany because we can really test early and therefore it's for me, a mixture between the test capacity, the ICU capacity, which maybe is the reason why Germany is at the moment on the lucky side regarding the handling of the patients and the death rate. One debate we have at the moment is how quick we should go back to normal times. And this is what we're trying, we get the answers through the doubling time of the disease. That means how quick we have the double number of infected patients. You see, when you would have 100 patients the first day, 200 patients the next day, and then 400, 800, we would have a doubling time of two days. The hospital capacity, even in Germany, it would be completely overwhelmed. Uh, so therefore, our statisticians calculated we should go for a doubling time of 14 days. And when we're reaching 14 days, then we should be able to handle the problem. And when you look to the doubling times, this is what, I, what is on the web available. Germany is at the moment at a doubling time of 12 days, so close to the 14 days. Uh, Austria, our neighbors is already above 14 days, so therefore they decided, the government decided to start slowly coming back to normal after the Eastern vacation. So it seems that the doubling time in a couple of areas now reaching the threshold that we can try to, yeah, to come back a little bit to normal time. Still under debate how we should do that, how we can we protect the older population, how we can protect the population who is on risk regarding the comorbidities. But I believe even from an economical perspective, everybody or every nation have to work on solutions how to overcome that complete restrict part. And I just get that from the news. Uh, Hong Kong um, reported that most of the patients who survived COVID-19 have had really a traumatic loss of the lung function. So for me, one of the completely unsolved questions is what happens in the follow-up, what happens in the future of a patient who survived the COVID-19 uh, infection, but it is something maybe we can discuss later during our Q&A session. So at the end, what we're doing, we're still doing prevention. 
And hopefully with that prevention and the hospital capacities we have in Germany, we should be able to handle the problem in an acceptable way. So therefore, I close my update and I will hand over now to Palav Shah, who will then debate with you the situation in UK. Palav. Thank you very much, Felix. Appreciate it. Um, I think that was a superb overview, not just of Germany, but also of the world status. And it kind of puts the whole thing into perspective. In the UK, we've been a little bit more uh, reserved, unfortunately. Um, and the big issue in the UK has been that the numbers have been increasing uh, gradually over the, this period. Um, so you can see that um, in the UK, we've had over 50,000 cases. And the death uh, Palaf, rate... Palaf, can uh, you share your screen? Yeah, I thought I had. Um... So I still see you. How's that? Okay, thanks. Yep, so basically just to go back to the UK, um, we've got over 50,000 cases, but unlike Germany and unlike South Korea and also Austria, we have had real problems with testing. There really has not been sufficient testing in the UK. We've had problems with the resourcing enough swabs, enough reagents for the testing. And so only a limited number of tests have been performed. And that might be one of the reasons why our death rate looks so high at 10%, because the real denominator of how many people affected isn't, isn't really a good um, um, reflection of what's going on. So th I think that's one clear explanation of it, but also I think the rationale that Felix gave, which is the number of ICU beds is very critical. In the UK, we have very, very limited number of ICU beds and you have to be really ill to get into ICU. So, so we do have a kind of intermediate setting, which is called high dependency unit. And whereas in Germany, I think the high dependency and ICU are much larger than they are in the UK. And I think that is one reflective factor of um, the limitations of what we're dealing with. Now, this, this graph really shows you the kind of takeoff of uh, COVID in the UK. We were pretty okay up until the middle of March, and then it started rocketing them up. And if you actually look back, uh, the school holidays happened at the end of February. And guess what they did? They went skiing in Italy and Switzerland, and then they imported it back to the UK. And all the clusters I'll show you later on are really around all the urban areas, particularly London, which is a very multicultural area. And in fact, the area where I work in, there are so many people from France, Switzerland, Italy, um, USA, uh, living and working here that uh, it was clearly going to be a big issue. And um, the other thing is that this, in some people it has a short incubation period and others it has a long incubation period. And then there's this group where they have no symptoms, but they keep spreading the um, organism everywhere. And also, if you look at the daily rates, you can see that the numbers are just continue, continually increasing uh, at a rapid rate. I think there's, it looks like there's a, a peak and then a drop off in the last few days, but I think that's artificial, particularly because it's just really too early to say that this is the peak level. The death rates, as we've discussed, have been very high in the UK. Uh, it looks really bad, but that's primarily because of one, the denominator isn't very clear, two, the patients coming into hospital are a lot more severe, three, there's a limitation of ICU beds. And, and very very similar to the uh, German numbers, the majority of people are elderly who are dying. There are a few youngsters who get a lot of publicity and press. So there's a, a big publicity in newspapers and the TV about uh, a 16 year old dying. And then there are a few 24 year olds dying, but on the whole, it is the elderly. And I did a very large COVID round this morning 
and we've got over 200 inpatients on the wards. And um, I saw three patients in their 20s, uh, about five in their 30s, about 11 uh, or 12 in their 40s, and all the rest were basically 70 years old plus. Most of the patients on our wards are 80 years older and more. However, if you go into the ICU, we've got 50 patients on the ventilator. That's basically the young group. And this is a reflection of the uh, rationing that we have to do because the people who are as sick as that over the age of 80 are basically in a palliative or end of life care pathway. Whereas if they're uh, below the age of 70, 75 and they've got very little comorbidity, then they're the ones who end up being ventilated in ICU. Now, the other surprising thing is when you look at the Chinese data, and hopefully we'll discuss this later on, it looked like the patients in China were only spending short time or short periods in the ICU from the early publications. But our experience up here is that the patients are actually in the intensive care unit for 14 to 21 days. So that's the other problem. We haven't got the turnover of intensive care beds that we'd like. So now there is a, a new strategy that we're trying to put people on CPAP at an earlier stage, just to see if we can uh, alter this uh, pathway. Now, this really puts the whole perspective into a picture. So it just shows you the cumulative cases, the cumulative death rate and the daily rates. Now, one of the problems that we have in the UK, and I think it will be really well worth discussing this, is that if I talk to all my colleagues and Felix, you um, mentioned that you are very aggressive when they come into hospital, you are offering them therapies. You have an algorithm which involves a number of medications from hydroxychloroquine to, through to um, uh, uh, the anti-HIV drugs, the protease inhibitors, through to uh, favipiravir. Whereas in the UK, we are not allowed to use any drug which is off life unless the patient is in a clinical trial. So the only patients who are getting active therapies are the ones that meet the criteria for clinical trials and are enrolled in clinical trials. And I think this is a big downfall for us. And also the milder cases are just getting no treatment. And this to me has a lot of implications because if they're not getting any treatment, they're infective. They're infecting other people. Whereas if you give antiviral treatments or hydroxychloroquine or other therapies earlier on, then one, you're reducing the infectivity and their RO uh, ratio and therefore reducing the number of people they can infect. But you also, to some extent, when these people are in hospital and not getting any antiviral treatment, their viral load is high and they, they pose a huge risk to healthcare workers. Whereas if they're getting some uh, antiviral treatment, then at least some of the risk to that uh, healthcare workers could be mitigated. So we have a lot of issues. And I think um, I personally am very critical of the way uh, the National Health Service and the Department of Health are handling this. I don't agree with their strategy, but I'm a lone voice, really, because most of the people are towing the um, national line. This just shows you the COVID map and emphasizes how most of these cases are in all the high populated urban areas, particularly London. I mean, the majority of cases are actually in London. And this really goes back to what I said about uh, people coming back from Europe and also the big business connections we have with uh, China. I think we had a lot of cases which actually came across over Christmas because of businessmen from Shanghai, Beijing, um, even Wuhan traveling to the UK and back over that period. So I think for the UK, this is going to be a very big challenge. And unless we get a strategy where we are treating these patients with antivirals at an earlier stage, we're going to struggle. So in the UK, just to finish, the only people who are getting uh, treatment are those who are participating in these clinical trials. So there's a big recovery trial, which is randomizing patients to either dexamethasone or hydroxychloroquine or uh, litonavir or interferon or azithromycin. We've got remac cap is basically an ICU study where they have ICU confirmed pneumonia. And if they've got COVID positive, they're allowed to enter this study. And then a principal study, which is in, in the general practice. So unless they're in these studies, they're not really getting any uh, therapies. 
So I think there's a lot to discuss, but I will hand over to Professor Mathura from India to give us his uh, view. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So uh, I'll be talking to you about the Indian update of uh, the coronavirus uh, as of today. One second, I'll just try to share the screen. So uh, as we all know, uh, starting off with the Indian statistics, India is the second most populous country in the world with a population of 1.37 billion people. Also, we are a diverse uh, population. We have 36 states in UK and 736 districts. Uh, the uh, other important thing is uh, India has a, uh, a large proportion of young population. 50% of Indians are less than 25 years of age. The COVID statistics uh, which we have as of uh, today, 6 a.m., uh, India has reported uh, 4,700 uh, positive cases and 133 deaths. If you look at the case density as opposed to the global average, which is around 173 cases uh, per million, India has a much lesser number, which is around three cases per million. Uh, same is true with the deaths, uh, which is much less than the global average, 0.1 versus 9.6. If you look at the, uh, the crude case fatality rate, however, it is around 2.8%, which is similar to that in the rest of the world. Now, looking at the uh, spread of the disease across the country, as of today, we can see that the, the, the coronavirus has spread across the country and has involved 32 of the 36 states. Uh, if you look into the districts, however, all the white ones which are marked are those which do not have the COVID-19. So uh, at least a couple of days ago also, roughly half of the Indian districts don't have at least uh, even one single case. Uh, briefly taking you through the Indian timeline, uh, the first case in India was actually on Jan 30. This was uh, exactly one month after the first case was diagnosed in Wuhan. Uh, the first three cases, all of them had come directly from Wuhan. There were students who were studying there. All of them had a mild disease, quarantined, and they did not transmit the disease. The next one month uh, till March 3rd, we had no increase in cases. This was uh, something like the silence before the storm. Then the actual number started from the first week of March. So somewhere from March 3rd to March 15th, as we can see in this graph, the number slowly picked up to 100. So these were all the cases who were coming from the rest of the globe. A majority of them had come from uh, the Italy, UK, US, the Gulf, Korea, and the Indonesia. And a very few of them actually came from the China. So from the March 20th was the exact date when the numbers started actually spiraling up. If you can see the graph here, from 20th, the numbers have started rising. So this is attributed to the second phase, that is a local transmission. And uh, we also have identified certain hotspots where the probable community level transmission also has started in the country. The, the most important thing in India is this lockdown, which has happened on March 25th. So this was uh, a day when we had 10 deaths and 500 positive cases. The prime minister had issued a nationwide lockdown for 21 days. We're already 12 days through the lockdown. This was uh, very well received by Indians across the country. So we can see some of uh, many villages actually, what they have done is they have created their own barricades, preventing people from actually coming in or going outside. Basically sealing off vast parts of the country from the rest of the country itself. Also strict police action against defaulters was another thing which actually helped us follow this lockdown very strictly. Now, if you look at the daily number of cases, uh, in the last four days, we have seen that the number of cases had crossed 500 per day. This is the largest we had seen in the last uh, two months. And this also has been attributed to this one so-called super spreading event, which had happened in Delhi. So this was a religious congregation of around 2,500 delegates uh, who had come from across the world in India. And then they traveled across the country. This, how, this had happened actually prior to the lockdown. And uh, of the 4,000 odd cases we had, more than 1,000 of cases were actually uh, linked to this one particular event. So 25% of all the cases we have right now are actually because of this one particular event. So briefly comparing the Indian scenario versus the rest of the world, uh, this table, though it is slightly complex, it shows that in the last 10 weeks, when we had grown from number three to 4,200, 
as you can see in the same amount of time the western world the number of cases have significantly risen much more than the rise which we have seen in our country the graphs also show a similar picture that the indian curve is less steeper than what is being seen in the rest of the world uh, so the golden question which has been asked multiple times is uh, did india actually flatten the curve so did we actually happen to slow the progress of disease so for this i would actually say probably yes as of today we seem to have actually slowed the curve however the next two weeks is very very crucial for us and this will actually determine where uh, a country is heading to so what could be the possible reasons for this uh, slow growth in cases uh, i think the first and the foremost most important thing is the early and a very strict nationwide lockdown which has been started uh, almost 13 days ago second a critical way of looking is also the low testing rate which i'll be talking about in the next slide uh some other postulates are probably the temperature which is more than 30 in majority of the country a paper which had looked into the spike mutations in the indian strain and also uh, a postulation of universal bcg vaccination and its protective effect against corona but these are just postulates i would say uh the testing rate which uh, professor hurth also was talking about if you look at the indian data we are actually testing a very few this is just 102 per million much less than the global average this could possibly lead to uh, under reporting of the cases however in india the testing criteria we have today all the cases uh, with severe respiratory illness are definitely screened and tested irrespective of uh, their travel or contact history mild symptoms are tested only if they have history of travel or contacts or healthcare workers so definitely we're not missing severe cases but then mild cases uh, we're not very sure the testing is slowly uh, increasing across the country last couple of slides the indian data is slightly different uh, it, this is uh, one of the hot spots the, the maharashtra the first 600 cases were analyzed and if you can see uh, 85% of them were less than 60 years even the global uh, uh, the, the national data also says that a majority of them were less than 60 years of age the deaths however are happening in people above 50 and in those with comorbidities uh, the age specific mortality rates again this is from one particular hot spot uh, this is similar to what was seen in the rest of the world uh, till 50 years the mortality rate is much lesser and then this slowly starts increasing every decade as the age increases so i think with this uh, 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 as far as the clinical experience is concerned i think our experience is still uh, building up so we would love to listen and learn from the rest of the world also with this i would like to end uh, my talk and i'd like to thank uh, my team members and special thanks to dr amita and pradeep for giving their data for making some of these slides uh, i think with this uh, i will end my presentation and uh, i will hand over to the egyptian uh, counterpart who's there here to share his egyptian data hello everybody well i think uh, Egyptian situation is going to match almost uh, what, what happened in uh, in India. You know, Egypt uh, is amidst the Middle East, and uh, it is in the middle of everywhere. Uh, it is in the basin of the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and actually, this is our last update. As you see, we have one thousand three hundred twenty-two cases confirmed amongst. Can, the, can you uh, share? Can you share your screen with us? We we don't see your sc uh, screen. Oh, oh, okay. So. Now it's uh, okay. No. No, we still see the video from. Yeah, oh, now it's coming. Yeah, good. Okay. So this is Egypt, and uh, Egypt is uh, around 100 million population. It is in the in the middle of everywhere, and it is one of the we have a touristic uh, area. So Egypt is in the basin of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. These are the cases confirmed, and uh, 
up till this is the last update we have 1322 cases confirmed amongst around 30,000 30, cases uh, uh, examined by BCR. The recovered are around 259 and deaths are 85 and the active cases are on treatment are 978. So again, we have a, a, a high considerable uh, death rate, which I attribute to uh, less co confirmed cases by or uh, tested cases. And uh, if we consider the curve and the, the, the rate, uh, uh, the first case discovered in Egypt was in the 14th of February. This is what the first case, and then the curve started to rise but not steeply, as, as you see, up till now we have only 1,000 cases, amongst maybe now we have two uh, more than two months. If we co compare it with the international figures like in Germany or in Italy, I think there is some difference in the uh, uh, attribution of cases and maybe, uh, uh, I don't know if we are flattening the curve. And uh, of course we speculate why this is happening Maybe the climate, as uh, Dr. Mater has uh, said, and uh, maybe the BCG vaccine. And also we have another theory, which we need to confirm. And there is an ongo ongoing research about this. If we actually have uh, some uh, uh, immunity regarding measles, because our children are all uh, uh, compulsorily uh, immune with uh, measles during childhood. So all of these are being um, tested right now to see if we have uh, something to, to say about this. Uh, we have a, a policy now, and uh, I believe the, uh, the, the constrictions and the regulations that have been done by the government have prevented a lot of uh, uh, dissemination of the problem. And uh, the, the curfew and the pen on flight and social distancing have been uh, you know, we have limited uh, resources for infection for, for, a, for a good number. And the problem is how, and I believe this is how to uh, lessen the mindness of uh, the disease and to treat other diseases because many people or many physicians now are minded with the COVID and they are trying to uh, prove it in many other uh, problems regarding the, the pulmonary uh, diseases. and. Uh, these guidelines have been made by my colleagues in the Ministry of Health and the, uh, in the Army and the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the university in order to triage people before we go. And now we have in Egypt around uh, 10 COVID hospitals and 10 COVID places uh, uh, distributed all over the country in order to receive the cases. Uh, uh, of course, the other areas are uh, being prepared, and especially we have the private sector is very important in Egypt. Also the uh, university hospitals. In every hospital now we are prepared with ICUs and, uh, um, and the beds speci specific and the, uh, sections specific for COVID. Uh, in, in just in case we have uh, a peak or increase in the flare-up of cases, which uh, didn't happen up till now. Uh, usually we say, yes, maybe we flatten the curve, but the problem is we don't have, and nobody can predict what this virus is going to, uh, to do in the next two or three weeks. So we are waiting to see, but we are prepared for this. We have more than uh, 5,000 ICU beds ready to, uh, to, to, to receive these patients. Uh, up till now, the numbers are very small, but we are waiting to see what's going to happen. Of course, these are the diagnostic and the treatment protocols we are doing, and uh, I think it's not uh, of big difference from what's going on uh, all over the world. Also, the treatment that we have, we go on chloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is uh, available beside the azithromycin. And also we give Osultamivir. Sometimes some people would give uh, uh, the, the uh, Actemra in some cases with a surge of cytokines. Uh, of course, there is some anecdotal evidence for the uh, anticonvalescent serum, which is going on as a research now. Also, maybe 
the primavir is going to be uh, introduced into a clinical trial in some patients also in the very uh, soon. Also, uh, I would like to say that uh, regarding the ICU patients, we, we are trying to uh, uh, ventilate the patient early. However, in some centers we are doing non-invasive ventilation using the high flow nasal cannulas and uh, because of the worrisome of dissemination, we use some uh, face masks, surgical face masks to prevent this. And I think it's going to be uh, of good deal to prevent some people or uh, limit some people going to invasive ventilation. But uh, I don't have the data now, but we are going on for this. And very soon, if we have more numbers, I think we will publish this uh, data. Again, we are concerned with the healthcare workers. Up till now, we have around 20 healthcare workers infected, and one of them died, who was a clinical pathologist. So we are going through this strict protocol for patients or healthcare workers uh, uh, dealing with them in order to protect the healthcare workers and isolate them in order they, they wouldn't be a source of infection in such cases. So I think this is our situation now, and uh, I hope in the coming weeks there will be published data about what's going on in the uh, relatively small number that we have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, I will ask Professor Lee to give the update from China. Um, so what is ongoing in China where it originally started? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear, we can hear you okay. and we can see you. Okay, uh, good afternoon to uh, Europe uh, colleagues and good, uh, good evening to the Chinese colleagues. Uh, to, uh, I'm talking about the uh, uh, epidemic situation in, uh, in China. Uh, this is the most update uh, data uh, in China. Uh, the, the, the so far, we have almost uh, about more than 80,000 cases so far. And here's the uh, new cases, uh, new, new, new confirmed case. case. Uh, and uh, based on the data, the mortality, mortality rate in Hebei province is 4.7%. 4 and Wuhan city is 5.1%. The mortality rate outside uh, uh, Hubei province is 0.84%. Uh, uh, and here we can see the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the new, new case uh, from uh, uh, 17th March, uh, the, 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 cake, the, the numbers here. So we can see we, this is so that the cumulative uh, input cases account for more than half of the existing conformed case, uh, cases uh, uh, in, uh, so, uh, now in China. Uh, and another uh, uh, main concern in, uh, now in China is the uh, asymmetric, uh, uh, asymmetric uh, patients. And this is the uh, 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 this is study uh, now is uh, still in preprint. Uh, the uh, the list, uh, 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 article uh, 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 so the twenty four uh, as uh, as met, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as asymptomatic patients in Nanjing, China, uh, twenty point eight percent develop uh, symptom. Uh, during hospital, uh, hospitalizing. And 50% have typical find of Tracer CT, and 29.4% uh, experienced no symptom or signs of COVID-19 with the younger age. Uh, median, median age is 14 years old. And I would like to, I, I would like to talk in as, uh, something about the measures for controlling uh, COVID-19 in China. 
uh, in China, we uh, the COVID nineteen was uh, outbreak in about uh, December twenty nineteen. So uh, we locked down the uh, Wuhan on twenty uh, third January. It means don't go to Wuhan, don't leave Wuhan. And also another uh, policy is transparency, uh, real time announcement of the uh, number of diagnoses suspected patients in every day in each city nationwide. And the inter interagency mechanism launched down to the, uh, and also uh, wearing mask is required in public place. Uh, this is uh, uh, on uh, January 20th, 2020. Dr. Zhong uh, had announced that uh, now announced that different human to human transmission and also confirmed that the medical staff had been infected. Uh, so, okay. And And here, uh, so that uh, uh, after lockdown, Wuhan, here we can see no one in the street except the police. Uh, and uh, as we know, then uh, after two weeks of the lockdown, uh, the uh, case reached to the reached to the peak. And four weeks uh, later, the uh, the uh, the situation is. Uh, uh, seems to under basic control. Here's two weeks to the peak and four weeks uh, go to the very low level. Uh, here we can see the down to the community level. Uh, at every entrance of the uh, department, uh, 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 apartment, uh, the every, everyone go or go, going or outside had received the body, uh, the temperature check and all the uh, and another uh, measurement is the early protection, like the social distance, and early detection, early diagnosis, and early isolation. And uh, this uh, uh, paper just published uh, last week. Uh, uh, it's the so that the uh, Fan Chan Shelter Hospital. Uh, it was uh, it was invented by Dr. Wang Wang Chen. Uh, this is the. Uh, this uh, the uh, this uh, shelter hospital is for uh, res uh, responding to the public health emergency. And another uh, measurement is uh, masking in public. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I think this um, was the overview about Asia, India. Africa, Egypt, as well as the situation in Europe. And um, I just want to start now the Q&A session. And uh, it's a pleasure to go through the diagnostic session. I just put a couple of questions on my charts I want to answer. So the question is really to how to diagnose. And this is something we're debating here. Due to our experience, we, we get in the last couple of weeks, I think everybody is in line that uh, swap PCR is at the moment that what we're calling the gold standard uh, to diagnose uh, COVID um, positive patient. But what we also learned that this are patient, this are CAT scans from our patient that. Um, the CT scan shows us quite nicely um, changings, which we bring in line with the COVID um, infection. And we also have a couple of patients who have the typical symptoms, a typical CAT scan, but still two or three negative swaps. So the question is for us, how we should use the CAT scan in the diagnostic algorithm. And there has been also one publication, oops, this was too quick, from the Chinese group. They showed that they using different um, pattern on the CAT scan and then they scored that. And by 
using a special scoring system, using linear opacity, consolidation, bronchial wall thickening, and also crazy paving pattern. They were able to have a little bit of better prediction about the severity of the disease. So it seems that CAT scan might be also uh, helpful um, in having an idea how the patient is my, might be developing regarding his disease. And therefore, my questions, and with the help of Joy, I also get that translated into Chinese. When we have uh, respiratory samples which are negative COVID, what is the next? Should we do a CAT scan or not? Uh, do we have, or do the Chinese uh, colleagues figure out any additional lab findings which may be helping us to have an idea? Can we keep that patient in a home quarantine or if we have the patient be under control, under control in the hospital? What happens with the CAT findings? We have seen uh, when we're doing it in the acute phase of the disease, but it's also something we discuss later. And also everybody is now looking for other tests to check the immunity of the patient. So the antibody tests, which are flowing in now on the market, uh, can we help them and can we use them to identify people who survived the COVID-19, develop the immunity and also maybe using the blood of those um, to produce antibodies and then maybe treating patients with that. So these are the questions I have. And uh, um, I, I think I want to ask Feng Ning Luo, who have been, I think, the longest time in Wuhan, how was the CAT scan used in Wuhan in guiding patients? Mm. Yeah, if the patient had, had the symptom of uh, COVID-19, all the history of uh, contact with the COVID-19 patients, maybe we can perform the CT scan for the patients. Um, sometimes without symptoms, some patients uh, still have the CT uh, signs of uh, uh, the COVID-19. So at the same time, we also perform the PCR test for the uh, patients at the same time, mm -hmm. yeah. So we use a lot of CT scan because in the early stage, and the PCR test is a lot uh, always available for us, yeah, in time. So you should mm -hmm. diagnose the patient in the early stage and separate them from the health, health patient, uh, health people. Mm -hmm. So it's very mm -hmm. important. I think sometimes the CT scan is very important, especially in the, a uh, situation that the PCR is not available for us. Yeah. Okay. So maybe asking that our friends from Hong Kong, uh, I know that Hong Kong is a very rich area. They should have a lot of CAT scans. So how are you using the CAT scan for the diagnosis of COVID patients? Uh, yes. Uh, of course we can afford uh, in Hong Kong, we can afford uh, to perform CT. However, there is uh, because of the risk to the staff of the radiologists, they usually quite reluctant to perform unnecessary CT scan for COVID-19 patient because most of the cases are quite straightforward in diagnosis because most are typical epidemiology with some respiratory symptoms and the golden standard we are still using is of course the PCR testing by various, uh, various routes, MPA, MPS, sputum, most of this case we can diagnose uh, by this way. However, as uh, Felix, you mentioned, some case uh, typical uh, features, even with some contact history, but test repeatedly negative. What can we do? Uh, at the time, we would do a CT. Because uh, I, I heard that from China experience, CT is a uh, chest, because if you rely a lot on X-ray, X-ray is very insensitive things. If this negative, despite uh, high clinical suspicion, we will perform a CT. Uh, usually the CT, if the CT shows some typical changes, consolidation, peripheral ground glass lesions, especially lower, lower, lower lobe, et cetera, we, we, together with the clinical features, we will tend to keep the patient in the isolated areas and test the patient repeatedly. Also, uh, 
designs the CT, we actually, of course, we can rely on the, and the, uh, we can rely on the laboratory test as well. Some features actually suggest the patient is more likely to be a, a real case, like the LDH, D-dimer, um, uh, lymphocyte count. If all these things suggest the patient is and clinically fever, uh, we would keep the patient in safe place, isolated, and repeat the test. Of course, CT scan will be done, but uh, not commonly done in Hong Kong, only in difficult case. We, we did the CT, okay. Yep. But uh, you see, to be, 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 I try to want to give a little bit of guidance to the audience. So we in Germany, when we have a patient who has the typical symptoms and maybe also have had contact and have negative swaps, but a positive CAT scan, we yes. counting yes. them as a COVID-19 positive patient and we handling them regarding the quarantine, regarding the personal protection uh, equipment. So we, if the CAT scan is positive, even the patient have a negative swap, be handling that patient like a COVID-19 person. Yes, we handle really them like as a COVID-19 patient. And at the same time, as you have mentioned, we will also check the serology for the patient. Um, mm -hmm. Some difficult case, if you have the positive serology, after that, we can check serial serology if this waste is still a confirmed case. But for us, we never confirm a case just by the CT scan, positive, but with all the negative swap, we still not confirm the case. But we treat him and isolate him as a case of uh, like just like a, a COVID-19 case. Okay, so I, have a, yeah, I, I have a uh, case, uh, have a favor and contact history of the uh, COVID-19 patient. And uh, uh, after uh, treatment uh, with the an uh, antibiotic, the uh, still favor for eight days. And uh, we performed several times of SOAM, but uh, negative. We also test, uh, detect the uh, IgM and IgG. At the first time, IgM is uh, negative and then mm -hmm. weekly uh, positive and then positive. But uh, after the uh, antivirus treatment and the patient recovered and uh, discharged from the hospital and uh, the test for the virus uh, of the PCR is still negative. So uh, in one case in Sichuan province, they performed nine uh, times of a swarm and uh, at the last time, they got the <laughs> positive rate. It's a, a very interesting case, I think, yeah. yeah. Felix, okay. if, I may just, hmm? if I may just interject, there's a beautiful German paper which is just about to be published in Nature Medicine, yeah. which actually did multiple swabs from every orifice and place in the 10 patients. And what they nicely have showed is that very early on, the transmission changes from nasopharyngeal between two to five days and then becomes lower respiratory tract. And so depending on when the patients present, the nasopharyngeal swabs may be negative. Now, in the ideal world, you, if you can get sputum, great, but also that induces a aerosol risk to the people around. Bronchoscopy is always positive, but again, you don't want to do that because that's a greater aerosol risk. My own feeling is that if you've got a positive C, uh, history, and a CT scan with similar characteristics, that should be the new gold standard. Yeah, yeah it's always the question of the availability and everything, how you handle that in the workflow. But I think that paper you mentioned from, from, from the Berlin group together with the Munich doctors who handled the first patient really showed nicely how long a patient is in fact infectious for the surrounding because what we learned most of our patient ICU when they are on the ventilator they are longer than uh, one or two days on the ventilator we have patients since 14 days on the ventilator and then it's always the question can you you still have you still still have to handle that patient like a COVID patient which is for the staff way more work because they have to wear the mask the 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 codes and everything. So this, there are a lot of questions. So, so again, uh, maybe a question to the Chinese colleagues regarding the antibodies. What we have learned in that paper, Palaf mentions, after 14 days, they were able to show in every single patient an EGM and after three weeks, an EGG reaction. Do you measure in China regular the production of the antibodies? Yeah, we... 
okay. I, we, we test the patient uh, uh, with the antibody IgM, IgG. I can show you a case. Can I show you a case with the... Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. A uh, moment, please. So somebody can talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going find, I'm sorry. So I, my uh, video camera cannot work. So uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, yeah. I, uh, have a, a, another uh, video conference. So uh, using Google. So <laughs> there is some conflict uh, of the software. So I, I could not uh, give, <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm sorry for you uh, killed for for you. So. Uh, I would like to give some comments about uh, the sampling uh, for uh, COVID-19 patients. So uh, it is very important to, to get uh, a positive uh, laboratory study. So uh, because uh, if just rely on uh, CAT scan, uh, so uh, there were bring some uh, uh, misdiagnosis of COVID-19 uh, because uh, very similar uh, 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 consolidation of, of pesticides uh, can be misdiagnosed as uh, COVID-19, especially uh, in the area uh, where uh, the doctors uh, or the physicians are not trained very well. So perhaps in the large uh, hospitals or uh, university hospitals, uh, it may not be uh, a big problem. So for uh, improving uh, the rate of, uh, uh, of possibility of the P of PCR, I think uh, the quality of uh, sampling is very, very important. So uh, like a throat swab or nasal swab, so also a simple uh, procedure, but it is very important. So uh, you should have a standard uh, procedure and uh, the operator should be very, very responsible, uh, uh, responsibility uh, uh, for uh, the job. And uh, the, the patient may experience a very <laughs> miserable uh, uh, feeling. So, uh, and also the uh, different uh, sampling can produce a different uh, positive rate. So uh, uh, in the very in initial uh, aid, uh, stage, so in Wuhan, uh, several patients uh, uh, are diagnosed that just by buff. So uh, uh, also uh, uh, the throat swab and also the uh, uh, the sputum are negative. So but the uh, lavage fluid is uh, are all positive. So uh, it is very important to, to collect uh, the lower uh, respiratory secretion. So, uh, so for sputum is better than uh, 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 throat swab. And uh, uh, nasal swab, uh, I think it is better uh, for the patient with upper airway sim symptoms, uh, but uh, uh, at a very uh, early stage. So most of the patient are, uh, do not have uh, upper airway uh, symptoms. So, and another uh, solution is that it is better for uh, for the physician to collect multiple samples. So uh, uh, you you can collect the upper uh, array uh, and the lower uh, array, and also uh, the, uh, the 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 stool. So this can increase the uh, the positive rate. That is my comment. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Feng Ming. You have to present. Yeah, you have to case. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll show you the case. And uh, Professor Guangfa uh, gave the uh, very important uh, comments for the diagnosis. Yeah. And so, uh, a moment. Uh, 
Yeah, here is the 37 years old male. The, it's the staff in the Red Cross Hospital in Wuhan, February for four days. And it's the CT scan from February 24 to March 13. And uh, after the treatment improved. And uh, it's the time. We can see here and uh, the PCT and uh, just uh, in February 25, the lymphocyte decreased and then recovered. And uh, other pathology of uh, influenza test all negative. And uh, here's the temperature very high. And uh, look at acid, uh, negative throat, negative and uh, and negative and uh, nausea, nausea negative. And IgM here is negative and uh, um, weekly positive and positive positive and the IgG still negative. And uh, after the antivirus treatment and the temperature decreased and uh, returned to normal. So it's the other female and uh, at first the uh, GGO here and after the treatment re resolved and uh, uh, turned to normal and uh, look acid positive, positive. And uh, even after the uh, CT scan uh, improved and still positive. And uh, so it's the, so it's, it's very, sometimes it's difficult to make a diagnosis for us to, to this kind of patient. Okay. Okay, her. What? Okay, I think um, to, to stay a little bit in time from the diagnostic approach, I think everybody here on the panel is agreeing that the swap is still what we calling the standard of diagnosis to identify COVID-19 positive patient. The, in case uh, multiple swaps are negative, we also should handle a patient who have the typical signs for a virus pneumonia in the CAT scan, CAT scan as a COVID positive case, even as mentioned, the swaps are negative. And uh, from the diagnostic approach, even what came from the colleagues, we should measure also other lab parameters like CRP, like the lymphocytes, like the LDH, which gives us a signal which might be the patient we have to take care on the specific uh, control and which patient we can handle maybe as a mild disease patient then we do not have to hospitalize that patient. So this is, was the diagnostic slot. Now we have to talk about the treatment options and therefore I will handle over the moderation of the treatment to Feng Ming Luo who spent a lot of time in Wuhan, uh, who spent a lot of time in the quarantine back home when he left Wuhan. So Feng Ming, treatment, uh, what okay. should we do? Okay, I have to share you the PowerPoint. And uh, so at first there's uh, some question about the, the treatment. And the first, uh, how about the progress of the treatment, uh, vaccine, and medication results of the different treatment and the studies. I think there's uh, maybe some studies uh, performed in Guangzhou. Uh, Professor Li, can you share us some progress of, for the treatment? Okay. Uh, uh, I, Chloroquine I, and the... Uh, I, uh, I think the, I, I can find the, the BBD. So, uh, if, uh, in... In, 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 in any other one to the talking something and then I, I can find the yeah. okay as as we know the vac, uh, vaccine is very difficult for RNA virus just like uh, HIV uh, for many years we don't have the vaccine for HIV 
And to the medication and the uh, other uh, medication, just like the anti other antivirus, maybe some, uh, we use some interferon injection for the patient to shorter the time of the positive of the uh, virus test. And uh, I think it's a work. Uh, and uh, other, uh, yeah, I think, Felix, yeah, can I you think have you good. some? You yeah. have some comments? Huh? Yeah, I think I think worldwide everybody is. Uh, there are a lot of companies working on working on vaccination, but personally, I don't believe that we will see any kind of vaccination within this this year. Maybe next year. It is complicated, <laughs> uh, and I think when you look to the to the to the growing evidence regarding all different antivirus drugs we have. I really haven't seen any data set which, which really convinced me. For me, it's a little bit, we, we are in line that uh, vitrochloroquine seems to help, especially when you start earlier. Um, we have our patients always on inhaled interferon um, alpha, but then all that additional antivirus options, I. I haven't seen any convincing data. Yeah? Everybody, sometimes you have the feeling everybody is trying where he has access to, and it's not really in a randomized controlled way. It's a little bit, okay, do it or leave it. So therefore, um, so I know that the WHO is trying to start an international, a multi-international trial uh, where the patient should worldwide then randomized into the diff into different fi into five arms. The question is when that trial really will start. I think everybody would be interested to participate in international international structured trials. The question is when that really will happen. Dr. Felix, uh, may I have a question regarding the drugs? Uh, uh, in, um, in China, you have uh, declared that uh, Primavera is the only drug that you uh, admit that it is, um, uh, it is accepted for treatment. So uh, is there a good evidence for this regarding, in comparison to other uh, modes of the therapy or antiviral, as you say? My question for the Chinese uh, colleagues. Professor Ni? Yeah. Regarding the Primavera. Okay. Oh. Yes, I I I uh, like to. Uh, I, can can uh, uh, can you uh, uh, oh, end yeah. the share? Oh, end the uh, end the. Okay. Okay. So, can you share the. So I I would like to. Uh, I would like to uh, show in as uh, the the study uh, we have did. Uh, in uh, in China, uh, uh, Canton Province, China, uh, the, uh, it, it was conducted by Dr. Zhong. Uh, uh, this is the open study. Uh, uh, totally, there there was uh, 197 patients uh, involved, uh, and the the dose is uh, 0 .05, uh, 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 per day, uh, one uh, gram per day. Uh, for 10 days and uh, we can see here the result that the, the uh, undetectable uh, viral RNA days uh, is uh, uh, about three days in uh, chlorocholine uh, uh, group compared to the uh, control group is three days to uh, nine days is uh, uh, P uh, 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 is uh, more less than 0 0.0, 0 0.001. Uh, so, and also the, uh, uh, the, the symptom, uh, the symptom is uh, fever, uh, the day of the fever is significantly shorter than the uh, control group. Also the uh, uh, safety is quite good. So this is for the, uh, uh, clocking uh, study in China. And I, another study I would like to talk about is the uh, recovery uh, plasma 
uh, treatment in uh, in 19, uh, 19 cases. Now it's still in the preprint. Uh, it's uh, totally 10, uh, 10 cases. Uh, it, uh, be, uh, before the uh, uh, receive the, uh, we, uh, we had had to detect the uh, nitro ligin antibody uh, titers uh, about one one to uh, six six hundred forty more than here more than this number and then let's see the uh, the cases in the laboratory. In days, it seems was uh, was uh, was improved, and uh, after two to five days later, the, uh, the virus DNA was turned to negative. All these uh, uh, all these ten uh, uh, ten cases, two to five days later, after we received the CP, and uh, uh, and also the no uh, uh, complications uh, was found. So this, I would like to uh, introduce these two uh, study in, in China, okay? Okay, so anybody else has uh, experience with uh, okay. the patient antibodies? Uh, uh, Felix? Uh, can I have some comments? I'm Guang yeah, sure. So, uh, I would like to talk about uh, some, <laughs> something uh, about uh, antiviral uh, agents. So, I'm a survivor from uh, COVID-19 and I use uh, 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 lopinavir, uh, uh, ritonavir. So, so uh, uh, after the, I, I start to use the drug uh, at uh, about three o'clock in the afternoon, and my uh, toxic uh, symptoms uh, uh, get better uh, in the night. And uh, on the uh, second day, so I I I took the second uh, dose after two hours, so my fever uh, vanished. So it seems that uh, it is uh, effective. So from uh, from uh, some individual uh, experience from uh, Korea, so they observed uh, a decrease of uh, uh, virus uh, uh, shedding. So it seems uh, so. Uh, in China, uh, another uh, group uh, uh, did uh, they, they performed a, a study. On um, uh, lopinavir, uh, ritonavir. Uh, so uh, it has been published in, in, in New England Journal. Perhaps you have uh, read it. So uh, although this is a negative uh, uh, result, so but uh, the design of the study uh, there should be some problem because they just uh, enrolled a severe case. So uh, for severe cases, uh, maybe uh, the start of the treatment may be late. So for antiviral uh, therapy, uh, so as we have learned from uh, influenza uh, treatment, it is recommended to use uh, the earlier, uh, the better. So uh, if we uh, change uh, the treatment, so uh, to more earlier case, so maybe uh, we can have a, a, a positive uh, result. So that is my own, own uh, uh, feeling. So um, may maybe not uh, correct. So I'm not quite sure. Uh, so uh, so Shi Yue, can you tell us uh, when uh, chloroquine uh, uh, were started uh, in your clinical trial? Uh, the, the time you means the time? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it it's uh, finished now. Oh, I I mean uh, when uh, you, you, you. It's in early stage or uh, late uh, stage. Uh, uh, about at the uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of uh, uh, January. Uh, I mean that uh, uh, for the clinic uh, for for the patient the clinical course. 
So at what date you begin to the uh, therapy? So from the the, the third days, uh, five days, or uh, uh, seven days. And uh, I'm 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 not uh, uh, I I I can. I, I cannot remember the date, but uh, yeah. I think it's just at the, uh, after uh, 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 in hospital, maybe onset, maybe at, uh, at the day of uh, maybe seven days after onset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the, all the antivirus uh, drugs, I think it's a, a early stage is very good. For the patient, even with the injection of the interferon, uh, mm -hmm. I think in the early stage it's very good. But the, if you use it uh, in the later stage, I don't think it's a work very good. Yeah. I agree with the I Professor agree. Wang. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps in the future, uh, if uh, uh, there will be new uh, design uh, uh, clinical trials, so. Uh, the the criteria for enrollment should be around uh, uh, early case, uh, not not a severe case, but maybe the the, the case has uh, the possibility to develop this uh, a severe case. So uh, I I think in the future we, we should uh, um, take care of uh, this uh, item. Thank yeah, you. The, uh, somebody asked about that the recurrence of the uh, 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 patient. Some patient discharged from the hospital and then test positive again. And so somebody have the experience for this kind of patient. How about uh, uh, Dr. Ning? Dr. Ning? Yeah. Ah. I, I, I can. I, okay. the, the voice a uh, little bit problem. Uh, oh. Can you say it again? Uh, the recurrence. Some yeah. patient discharged from the hospital and then test positive again. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Some some case uh, we uh, we have found that it's, uh, about I I have uh, no exact data, but we 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 saw that some cases happens. So how about the experience in Hong Kong? Yes, uh, actually, this is also the question I really want to ask. Because um, the, at the end stage, when the patient's near recover, we always see the patient uh, become negative, and then the next test become positive, negative, positive, uh, changing. And sometimes we actually worry, even after the uh, so-called discharge criteria in China and in Hong Kong, I think it's the same, uh, mm -hmm. subside clinical symptoms together with Two negative um, uh, MPA MPS yeah. um, okay. break by twenty four hours, but after this, when it discharged the case, I I some case in the community, I think if you test again, some will still be positive on and off. But yeah. most important for us is in, in China. Is there any experience with this sort of cases? That is this sort of cases is still infectious. It's still in some people in the community will be infected by this so-called recovering patients actually with positive uh, PCR. Uh, in Hong Kong, we, we try to think that um, this is likely to be just a, a dead body of the, of the virus uh, mm -hmm. uh, because our PCR is too sensitive. So we still follow this guideline, just discharge the patient, ask the patient to uh, take precaution at home after discharge. And uh, actually in China, because lots of patients in your experience, do you experience someone that is really recurrence that can infect other people or just you think it's that virus that the positive test is due to? I, I think sometimes it's just because the false uh, 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 negative of the uh, virus test sometimes, I think. And so we ask the patient to uh, quarantine for more than uh, two weeks after discharge from the hospital. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. can I show you? Okay. So, so this uh, practice is already very safe, is it? In your experience? Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Two more. I would like weeks. to give some comments. So I'm going far. So uh, it is frequently uh, talked by uh, um, many Chinese uh, uh, physicians, so pulmonologists, uh, about the, the uh, re positive after discharging from the hospital. So 
uh, right now, uh, some uh, only one paper uh, have been published. So uh, they thought that uh, uh, they have uh, maybe 65, uh, uh, 56 uh, patients and the five patients uh, have uh, uh, repositive and uh, one patient have fever. Uh, so this uh, this patient, uh, uh, others uh, have uh, some symptoms, respiratory uh, symptoms. So uh, the paper uh, thought that is uh, relapsing uh, of uh, COVID-19, uh, but uh, I, I can not agree uh, uh, with them. So uh, because uh, I, I quite agree uh, with uh, 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 that the false uh, negative result uh, during uh, the hospital and after discharging, then a real positive uh, result. So um, uh, that is possible because uh, if you test uh, in the isolated world, uh, uh, the nurses uh, are very, very busy. So uh, it is a uh, uh, tough uh, labor work. So for everybody uh, with uh, very uh, thick uh, mask, uh, uh, goggles, and also uh, the, the cover all uh, suits. So uh, it is not good for them to, uh, to collect, uh, uh, have uh, enough time to have the guarantee uh, the, the quality of the sampling. So uh, after discharging, so uh, there are only a few uh, patients need uh, uh, to recheck. So they have more time. Uh, the protection is not so, so, uh, so, uh, so thick. So uh, maybe uh, the sampling may be better. So not, that is the explanation for the repositive. Another uh, issue is that uh, repositive uh, cause uh, transmission of COVID-19. Mm. The answer is no. So right now, so also uh, uh, at least uh, uh, over uh, uh, several, uh, not not over 100, but but maybe. Uh, uh, 20 or 30s, so there is no report for transmission after discharging from the hospital. So uh, that maybe uh, the virus is died. So, and uh, just uh, 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 get away from the body uh, after the, the cells death. So that is, uh, uh, that is my, uh, my okay thank you okay thank you so maybe, I, I, maybe can, when i can ask one question because we know already in the debate mm -hmm. we'll be mixing the session two and three um and therefore i want to ask the chinese and even the hong kong colleagues what is your requirement that the patient is discharged from a hospital so how many days he patient must be asymptomatic, how many swaps you want to see, because worldwide, I think this, there is still a debate ongoing. When do we, when can we discharge patient from the hospital? So what is the, 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 the recommendation from China regarding that is the end of the disease, we can send you home. And then do we have to put patients on quarantine back home or can the patient go back to the family? So what is, ongoing in China. So uh, Professor Wang, uh, Guangfa, has <laughs> the experience. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you, you, you know it uh, very well. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, as you, uh, yeah I, I can explain first and then you can uh, make some uh, comments for it. Yes. At first, the patient should be discharged from a hospital in uh, low favor for at least three days and uh, the CT image improved and the uh, symptom improved a lot. And uh, then uh, two times of the uh, negative PCR test for the virus. And then the patient can be discharged from the hospital, but 
after discharge from the hospital, quarantine for more uh, another two weeks. So after that, maybe the patient can go, uh, go to uh, go home. Yeah, that's the uh, criteria for the patient discharge from the hospital. Okay. But is that bit, so, so to chat for the others, for India, Egypt, and uh, Palaf and uh, London, you, you have the same policy or you do something completely different? Um, no, like I said before, we don't really have any antiviral therapy unless they are in a clinical trial, which I think is uh, one of the UK stances. Uh, we've been trying to lobby the government to change that, but they will not let us. And I think that's one of the big mistakes. And discharging, when you have the patient on the board, when you discharge patients after having a couple of days was it? Well, the minute, the minute they don't require oxygen, they're out of the door. Okay. Yes, it, it's a very quick turnaround. So even if they're infective, they go home because we just don't have the beds. Okay, completely other okay. situation in China. India? Yeah, uh, Professor Felix, so i just like to add on. Uh, in India, the current situation is that uh, we, we have uh, uh, adequate number of beds as of today. So anybody who comes positive, uh, irrespective of the severity of symptoms, uh, is admitted to a dedicated COVID hospital. And uh, the current guidelines, the, the, the uh, national guidelines says that anybody who comes positive has to be in the hospital for uh, 14 days. And uh, he can be discharged uh, only uh, if he get two uh, consecutive swaps, which are negative, uh, 24 hours apart. Plus, there should be a clinical resolution of symptoms. In India, at least, we're not doing CAT scans uh, as often as I think is being done in China. So we, we are more, pro, more relying upon the, the clinical resolution of symptoms, the X-ray resolution, and uh, two documented uh, swabs which are negative. As Dr. Pangman has rightly said, uh, uh, we are also asking the patients who are going back home to be in home isolation for two more weeks. Uh, this is just to make sure that they don't go and spread the virus again in the community. And uh, so basically for 28 days after the onset of uh, the disease or the time they come positive, the, the, the person is basically isolated from the community. So after two weeks of home isolation, then they are, uh, uh, are uh, asked to go back to their uh, normal duties. So this is the current situation, but if okay. the numbers... Egypt, what is Egypt doing? Well, in, in Egypt, usually we, we, we stand up till the patient has two consecutive uh, PCR negative, separated by 72 hours. And uh, then we follow up the patient after one week and uh, we, we do another PCR and actually we, we look for other complications because we have some people uh, with thrombotic complications that happened after the, their discharge. So we are concerned with this very much. And also with the remnants of fibrosis and uh, uh, the, the patient uh, physiological uh, attitude after uh, apparent uh, cure. Professor, okay, in Hong Kong, Big Lamb, what's what you're doing? Well, I think uh, first of all, up to this particular moment, so-called mm -hmm. antiviral treatment for COVID-19, no drug has been proven to be useful. So I would assume for the majority of the patients who recovered because of their immune system works, handle the virus. Therefore, once the patient recovered from the disease, is there really a need to retest for the nucleic acid? Because those that can be just a remnant of the virus, once they recovered, they shall not be infectious, whether or not the nuclear acid is test positive or not. So why bother to test? Once they have recovered, say three days, symptom free, fever subsided, shall we use CT to monitor? Well, I don't think so because there's something called radiological delay. And since the patient already recovered, it's unlikely to have so-called relapse. I do not trust in this so-called relapse story. So I guess this is a new disease. There's no guideline, and even if there's a guideline, it's not based on any evidence. We can just use conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. Now we are talking about using covalent serum. That means the antibody should be protected. Therefore, these mm -hmm. antibody can be donated to treat patient. Just like many of the panelists talking about, it's really difficult to do drug trials because antivirus should be given early, cytokine storm should be treated late. So we must 
control all these factors, but then we can never control the factor of immunity of that particular patient, no matter how we do the randomization, viral load, immunity of that particular patient, time of disease onset, all these should be considered before we can have a solid data, which drugs is really effective. I totally agree with Felix that I do not have much faith in, in the so-called vaccine. It will not be available soon. And even when it's available, are you going to take the vaccine? Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. And I think since this majority of the patient recovered, so the immunity is what we can rely on, but we still need to handle the so-called cytokine storm. Sometimes happens. Hmm. It's yeah. not evidence based, of course. Yeah. But if, but it, it it seems to me a little bit uh, in the diagnostic. We I think worldwide we are in line that we should use the swab, that we can use CAT scan, that we look to lab findings in the therapy. I think everybody believes in the data uh, we have seen from China that chloroquine might work even in moderate cases, really mild cases, which are not admitted to the hospital. We do not have experience with the chloroquine. And then all that antiviral options, are, we do not really have very good data. Uh, we, we, I'm not so sure if we're ever getting those data because at the moment it's more a little bit an action-driven decision. Okay, next day, next trial, next truck, and not really a structure plan. But I think how to handle the patient regarding discharging and the follow-up, there is a, a wild spectrum worldwide. Palaf, no a patient without oxygen, oxygen need out of hospital. Uh, India, out of the hospital, 14 days in quarantine. So there is a, just a wide spectrum how we handle those patients after stabilization of the infection. Yeah? Um, even here in Germany, it's not clear, should we do a repeated swap or, or can we say after 14 days, everybody produced antibodies so we don't have to take care of the swap because the patient is has developed immunity. I think in that handling of the patient, there are still a lot of open questions. Yeah. And, and even for the, for the question of diagnosis, if, if we highly suspect that patient is suffering from COVID-19, whether or not it's positive and there's any evidence, we just manage as a COVID-19 patient, but eventually you cannot count this patient as a COVID-19 patient. <laughs> because of lack of the nuclear exit test positivity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe when I can ask you that question, I showed in my presentation that uh, what I get from the, from, from the newspaper from Hong Kong that uh, the lung function is six weeks after the infection chromatically um, decreased by 30%. Uh, how is the experience in China and in, in Hong Kong regarding when you see a patient after six weeks again, is the patient really chromatically um, impaired by the infection or is the patient still normal, healthy like he was before? So what happens on the long term on patients who survive COVID-19? Hong Ming can talk about this because we had a similar question yesterday. Okay. To some good data regarding the lung. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I have uh, two cases. Is very 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 critical, and after recover, the lung function improved later by later, and uh, I think six weeks is still very very so short time for uh, very very critical patients. So I think we have some uh, experience with other diseases, for example influenza, and uh, the, some patients recover totally from a very very bad. Uh, CT scan and the lung function and uh, still recover to normal. I have a one, uh, one case of, uh, only 38% uh, of post-oxygen uh, uh, saturation and after the treatment without the intubation with the light, uh, and uh, only non-invasive ventilation and uh, steroid the patient uh, survived and uh, 
we follow up every week and uh, step by step the patient recovered and can go around the, in, in his home. And I think the don't worry about the fibrosis of this uh, kind of patient of COVID-19. It's different from the SARS. Uh, we know that SARS is, uh, have a lot of uh, fibrosis in the lung. So don't worry about it. Most of them recovered from the disease, I think. Yeah. So uh, 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 I, we, we are uh, just uh, doing some studies uh, so in China. So uh, from our uh, studies, so the instance of uh, fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis after COVID-19 is very, very low, uh, about less than, than 1%. So, uh, so we are, uh, the, the study is performed in a uh, patient registering uh, system. So perhaps we can, uh, have a lower estimation of uh, the instance. So, but mm, uh, from uh, the uh, recently, uh, recently discharged uh, 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 patients in Wuhan, so uh, about five, uh, five to 6% of the patients have a typical pulmonary fibrosis. So most of the patients are uh, 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 infiltration or uh, interstitial uh, pneumonitis, so not, not uh, fibrosis. So I think uh, the instance rate, rate of pulmonary fibrosis is very low. So uh, uh, in, in SARS, so uh, after discharging from the hospital, uh, those patients have a uh, some reach of uh, uh, op opacities, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, almost all the patients uh, resolved uh, during uh, uh, two years follow-up. So uh, I think it is similar to, to SARS. So, so perhaps uh, the damage to, uh, to the uh, lung uh, may not uh, cause a persistent uh, uh, change so uh, to the patient. Uh, 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 when I uh, discharged from the hospital, so I felt uh, uh, cough, uh, uh, mild, only mild uh, uh, shortness of breath, but uh, uh, I, I do not check my uh CT scan right now so so i don't know my my disease <laughs> so because uh, <laughs> i'm a mild uh, disease so very mild so uh i think uh, the damage to the uh, lung function may relate to the severity of the disease if the patient have a severity of the disease so uh, they need uh, uh, CAT scan or uh, lung function test. So the time is too short. So uh, maybe we, we need to wait uh, some time to, uh, to follow up uh, this patient. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, I'd like to uh, 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 share my some results from our uh, uh, follow up uh, patients. So far we have collected uh, about uh, one, 100 uh, cases uh, discharged, um, uh, about uh, more than 40% of the cases uh, show that the lung function so that the uh, diffusion, uh, 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 diffusion uh, ca ca uh, capability, uh, ca uh, ca uh, capacity, it was a uh, decline uh, than the normal. So I think the uh, diffusion uh, uh, decline. The, the, the diffusion function was uh, declined for uh, about uh, forty per, per percent of the patients after discharge. Our data show that. May I have a question, Doctor Lu? Uh, yeah. uh, we have a notion that uh, many of these patients, uh, after uh, progression of the disease, they tolerate hypoxia. They they are. Uh, there is discrepancy between their symptoms and the level of hypoxia, and some of them tolerate levels up to 
40% oxygen saturation, they are doing well to talk about that. This made some people reluctant for intubation. So my question is about the uh, threshold for intubation and ventilation, and uh, also the, the rule for um, non-invasive ventilation, especially the high flow nasal, and the worrisome about the splash and uh, spread of virus in the working area. You, uh, you just ask about the ventilation, yeah. First of all, do you have an explanation why this patient tolerate hypoxia in a in a very strange way? This is a notion from many colleagues. Yeah, hypoxia is different from other disease. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, some patient with lower uh, oxygenation uh, index and uh, they still uh, feel very good, right? Yes, some patients uh, 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 some patients uh, have this situation, uh, but this kind of patient maybe progress very fast in some cases. So you should be careful for them. And sometimes we still use the high flow and the lung invasive ventilation for this kind of patient. Yeah, is that because of intrapulmonary shunt? Maybe. Wise, yeah, low oxygenation, but they still feel good. We yeah. don't know. We, we have low data, but it's very rare. But some patients have still have this situation. Yeah. But you, this should, is not a much you should wise, still right? pay attention to the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, Lam mentioned, I think uh, we always seeing that the patient with cardiovascular comorbidities have a have a worse outcome. And there is uh, one publication from Wuhan where they operated two patients on lung cancer not knowing that they have COVID. And then the patient get COVID a couple of days later, so they have tissue. And they showed that also the vascular system, so the capillary vessels are involved in that disease with, with swelling and all the inflammation stuff. So shunting might be an explanation for mm -hmm for for that situation but i think everybody as i think we should try to stabilize the patient with high flow and in case of a hypercapnia also with non inflammatory ventilation before we intubate those patients because when the patient is on the into on the ventilator the situation is so uh, i agree out I being on later two later associated complications yeah. yes uh, Felix, uh, I agree with you. So uh, uh, COVID-19 is a little different from other uh, pneumonia. So uh, like SARS, so, uh, but uh, uh, is, uh, not SARS. So um, uh, SARS, uh, the patient will, uh, will get its peak uh, uh, at about uh, one week. So, but uh, COVID-19, uh, it seems that the patient is mild, uh, the fever uh, up and down, and, uh, and the knees uh, paralyzed uh, the, uh, the, the, the physician. So uh, the, this is a mild case. So, but at about uh, 10 days, so uh, some of the patients have uh, a uh, sudden uh, deterioration. So I worried about uh, uh, the, the premier of, King, uh, of, of United Kingdom. So uh, Boris, so he just uh, 10 days. So the fever persistent for uh, is very long. So this area is very dangerous. Uh, this period is very dangerous for the patient. So maybe the patient will have a, a, a sudden uh, 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 deterioration and the respiratory failure uh, will appear. So uh, that is our experience in China. Okay, maybe I can ask Dr. Pan. Um, he is also, I know that he worked on an ICU. Uh, can he give us an advice how he handled his patient? Dr. Pan, you are still with us? Uh, no, cannot see him anymore. 
he maybe is on the way on the ICU and he has to work. Yeah? <laughs> ICU doctors are always busy. So I think, um, uh, as mentioned, um, the company Joy only asked me to moderate the session because the German always have a are the timekeeper. So we have uh, exactly reached the end of uh, that international meeting regarding COVID-19. It was a pleasure to talk and uh, to hear again the experts from China, what they learned, what they give us as an advice that we can handle in, e in India, in Egypt, in the UK as well, in Germany, the patient in the best way. I think we learned that the swap is still the standard of care in the diagnostic approach. A CAT scan might be helpful. In the treatment, as mentioned before, we have chloroquine as a drug, we have data, and everything else is something we have to do in clinical trials to increase our experience. Uh, vaccination might be coming, but I think most of us agreeing it will be too late. Um, Ventilation is something we have to offer in a couple of patients, but we should do that even at last to keep the patient as long as possible, non-intubated if they're tolerating that. And we also have to take care of the patient in the follow-up to observe and to increase our knowledge if we getting any chronic disease out of the COVID survivors. But when I listen to the Chinese doctors, the rate is not comparable to what they have seen during the SARS um, area. So therefore, um, I, it's my honor now to thank you again for your participation, for your input. I hope all the audience which listened to us in the last uh, nearly two hours learned a little bit from us. Um, and um, I also want to thank the company again to give us the platform. I wish you all very successful days in the in uh, com coming days that you really can treat your patient in the best way. I hope that from the panel also only Gua Fang was the only one who went through a disease that we all other can stay disease free. And I hope that we can meet quite quickly personally again on one on, on the international conferences. So all the best for you and stay healthy, my friends. And uh, have another in one week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye. you, Phil. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Best to yeah. all. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you all. Yeah.